this morning. Sing this out when darkness, when darkness tries to roll over my bones. When sorrow comes to steal the joy I when brokenness and pain is all I know, I won't be shaken. No, I won't be shaken. Amen. Come on, let's sing this out. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand.
battle again. He is jealous for me.
going to do a song. We're going to kind of teach it to you. A lot of y'all will probably know the words to this, so you are welcome to sing along. The words will be on the screen. I done told them several times, told them this morning, 
And all my, my daddy's mama was Sadie Neely. She was a little Southern Baptist woman. My mama's mama was Annie Lou Edie. She was a Pentecostal woman. I said, y'all going to mess up. You're going to wake the wrong one up one day. <laughs> so uh, anyhow, gosh, it's good to celebrate the resurrection, is it not? Just a couple of weeks, man. Gosh. But we ought to celebrate it every day. Every single day. Um, we don't know when he's coming back. For, but for those of us that are in Christ, it is great to know, is it not? That we are going to be raised to life because he is raised today. So uh, excited about that. And you and I walk in newness of life every single day. And we're going to do that through the scriptures this morning. I want to invite you to turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 once again. Uh, just wanted to hit two messages out of 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. And this is the second of those messages. And uh, we're talking about culture shift overall. The fact that there is a desperate need for a shift in the culture. While you find your place there, I want to welcome you. If you're visiting with us, whether online or in person, I want you to know that we uh, don't overlook that. We don't take that uh, for granted. We're thankful that you're here. Um, if, you, um, if you visit more than three times, we talk about the fact that you've drunk the Kool-Aid. You're going to have to keep coming back. You're going to have to stay. So, um, so we encourage you to make at least three visits. <laughs> uh, but we're, we're excited about what God is doing. Um, I believe that there is a... Um, just a, a new season in the air. I really do. Um, I think folks are at the point now to where um, we're, we're all kind of peeking out of our houses, it feels like. Um, we've done this several times over the course of two years. We peek out and it seems like we get shoved back. And then we peek out and we get shoved back. But for whatever reason, I am very excited about this whole year, but I'm super excited about this spring. And it is just great to, great to see you. Um, uh, I'm going to, before I get to get off track, I'm going to dive in. But 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, last week we talked about the joy of reflecting on how the gospel changes a culture. And it seems to be that that was the heart of the Apostle Paul entering into 1 Thessalonians was that he was just overwhelmed with, the joy, with joy over how the gospel had changed a culture. Uh, one of the great culture shifts I believe we need today is desperately is that we need to see godly men being raised up. We desperately need to see that was an opportunity for all the women in the house to go, yes, Lord. Um, so I'm gonna give y'all another, another chance. One of the greatest needs we have in the world today is to see godly men being raised up. Yes, yes Lord. Amen. Whatever. Um, but we, we, we do. I, I believe that men are to be the leaders that God has set forth and if we're going to see anything, that doesn't mean that all of us don't need to live godly, but we desperately need to see godly men. Our world needs to see men of God standing up with integrity and seeing through the things that they've uh, said that they would do and being all that we need to be for, for our homes, for the community, for church, and for this world, for the gospel's sake. And I believe Paul was just rejoicing over that culture shift, that there was a change. And God does that. He changes people, just as it talks about in John chapter 3, when Jesus met Nicodemus, he said, Nicodemus, you must be born again, or you cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. And so you must be born again. You must be reborn. And, and we know that that life is transformed, 2 Corinthians five seventeen, that the old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new, that God is, he does a rebirth in our lives. And so Paul was reflecting on that joy. This morning, I want to talk about the journey of the gospel into a lost world. The journey of the gospel into a lost world. We're going to do that. I'm going to read the first, I'm going to read all 10 verses of 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 to set the stage. And then we'll look at a few of the verses basically in the second half of the first chapter. It says, Paul and Silvanus and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of our God and Father, knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia 
and uh, who believe. For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith toward God has gone out, so that we do not need to say anything. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. Let's pray. Father, this morning, God, once again we pray that You would ignite a fresh ember. Uh, not that we need a new spirit, not, not that we need a new revelation, but God, that You would ignite within us a fresh and a new what's always been the bedrock of the Christian faith, the gospel. Would you, Father, empower in our lives the opportunity to share the gospel? Would you take this message this morning and would you ignite within us something that causes us to burn with a fervent desire to share the gospel? Lord, if there's anything that we need today is we need changed lives. We need lives changed in Washington. We need lives changed in the state houses. We need lives changed in, in our community school boards and in our city councils, God. We need lives changed. We need lives changed in the church house. We need lives changed in homes, God. We need lives changed all over this world and in every single place and every single format, God. And the only thing that's going to change a life for any good is going to be the gospel. So, God, those of us that have the gospel, those of us that have been, our eyes have been opened, and we now don't, we now walk not in darkness, we walk in the light. God, would you uh, just stir up within us, Father, a, a desperate need for sharing the truth. Father, if there's anybody that is slumbering or sleeping, Father, in the faith, God, would you awaken our hearts and our lives, myself included, God, would you ignite within me, a passion for the gospel. And Lord, if there's anyone that's lost, anyone that's playing church, anyone that's uh, on, on the fringe, we would say, even though we know that you can't walk the fence, you're either for or you're against, but you, Father, would you ignite within them, Lord, uh, I pray for their, uh, their salvation. I pray, God, that you would save them. I pray that you would open their eyes to the gospel. And I pray, Lord, that you would do all these things for your glory and for your sake. In Christ's name, amen. Culture shift. That, that Paul saw a culture shift in Thessalonica. Paul saw a culture shift in Jerusalem when he came to faith in Christ. When he was persecuting the church and Christ was igniting a fire through the birth of the New Testament church and the Holy Spirit of God as he had told them to not go uh, anywhere but to go up into the upper room and wait until you receive power from the Holy Spirit of God. And he's, he told them that they were to go out and that, that igniting of the passion, the power that, of the gospel of Jesus Christ going out through the world. Paul saw the, the culture change. He saw the culture in his own life change. He saw the culture in people's lives and their homes change. Even the jailer, when he went to wash the wounds of the apostle Paul, he saw the lives of the people even in the jailer's house get changed. And so Paul goes to Thessalonica, but don't miss this. Paul's journey to Thessalonica did not come without going across other places where the gospel was not received. And that had to be disheartening to him. I mean, can you imagine after you have been moved from death to life, from darkness to light, and when you've been radically shifted in your culture like that, you've been changed, and you're so excited because now you know the cure to the problem. And that is the ultimate problem in life, is it not? It's death. I mean, we fight a lot of things in our lives, but the one thing that we most concern ourselves with is are we going to die, and when, when are we going to die, and how are we going to die, and can I prevent myself from dying? That is one of the greatest questions of what happens after I die, and who's right about these things? And when you see somebody come so, so full circle like the Apostle Paul or anyone that's come to faith in Christ, and God has commissioned us to go out and to tell, when we go tell and it's rejected, can you imagine the, just the, um, the, the, the discouragement, maybe the, the, the frustration, the, the, the pushback that you feel? 
I don't know if you've ever shared the gospel with somebody that did not receive it, would not take it, and it was like, uh, it was discouraging you because you know what's going to happen if they do not come under the gospel of Jesus Christ. If they do not get saved, the outcome is not good at all. As a matter of fact, it is the worst outcome that there is on the face of this planet. The Apostle Paul felt that discouragement, I believe. He's a human being just like the rest of us. Even though he's excited about the gospel, he presses forward, he pushes on. But nevertheless, don't miss the fact that he had been whipped. He and his companions had been beaten because of the gospel's sake. They didn't want to hear it, and they didn't want to hear it so much so that they whipped them with reeds to keep them from sharing the gospel. And the, Paul, the Apostle Paul, he presses on, and he gets to Thessalonica. And it seems like there is this great reception of the gospel. I mean, I said in the first service, they were eating it up like Tic Tacs almost. It was just like they were taking it, man. And the, the lives are being changed. And while lives are being changed, he, he is reflecting on this great joy. And I don't want to, us to miss how the gospel gets into the lost world. So th there are many different philosophies about how you share the gospel with people throughout all the cultures of the world. But I believe there are some common denominators that are going to happen in every single situation if it is done rightly. And that's what I want to look at this morning. So let's look at the journey of the gospel into a lost world. I believe that the gospel, as it journeys into a lost world, it's coached by God through people that are previously changed by it. I'm going to show it to you in the text right here. I'm going to start with um, verse 3. Paul's remembering. He says, Remembering without ceasing your work of faith, your labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of our God and Father, knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. And you became followers, listen to what he says, of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit. Did you hear what he said? He said, the gospel that came to you came to you in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance. He said, you saw what manner of men we were before you he said, and you became followers of us and of the Lord. Now, that's a lot packed into just those verses. But here's what I want to bring out to you. The Lord Jesus Christ will be celebrating the resurrection from, from the dead uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ here in just a couple weeks. But don't miss the fact that he came to this earth before he was ever crucified and before he was ever buried and, and, and raised from the dead and ascended. Jesus Christ came. We celebrated at Christmas time. The, the, the coming of Emmanuel, God with us. When God came to ignite the race of the gospel being shared on the face of this planet, the first person he enlisted into the race was Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came to this earth. Uh, have you, many of you have heard of a relay race, I'm sure. A relay race is made up of several legs, many legs, and until the full circuit is made, you keep running the race. It's almost as if God, in, through the, to, to bring the gospel to the New Testament church and to the New Covenant Christians, he, it's almost as if He took a baton and gave it to Jesus Christ, sent Him here to this earth. And when people started to come to faith in Christ in the New Covenant age, it's almost as if Jesus Christ handed off to the church the baton. As he handed it off to the, uh, the disciples that, that, were, that he handpicked around him, uh, Peter, James, John, and the rest of them, he handed it off to them. The Apostle Paul comes along, he hands it off to him. The Apostle Paul is going throughout the known world, and he is handing the baton off. When he gets to Thessalonica, he hands the baton to the Thessalonians. But he said, this gospel, this baton, this gospel that has come to you, it came to you through much power and the Holy Spirit. It was not that they just spoke words to them, although we know words are important with the gospel. We need to share words, but it's not just mere words. The Apostle Paul came with a testimony that God radically changed his life, that God had transformed not only his life, but many other lives, and he was coming, and he was handing that baton off to them, and he says, I want you to come follow me as I follow Christ, and I'll show you that in a minute. But they were not just doing they were not just sharing any gospel it is a gospel that changes people and that's what 
they were teaching. Let me show it to you in a few verses and then we'll, we'll move on. Peter, I believe, admonished them, even from the Old Testament in 1 Peter 1, 13 through 16. He says, Therefore, gird up your lo the loins of your mind, be sober, rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the, at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts, as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. And so Peter is admonishing them in the changed life, in the gospel of Jesus Christ, how they would live their lives. Don't miss the fact that the Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 where we read, don't miss it, that he said, you remember what kind of men we were when we came to you. They were changed men. They were men that had been discipled by Jesus Christ for, for nearly three years. The Apostle Paul spent nearly three years himself under the tutelage of people who had come along before. And when you think about going into Thessalonica, almost a barren world without the gospel, he comes in. They have nobody, but they have the Apostle Paul. That's why he stayed as long as he did. They had nobody else, and he, he uh, discipled them, and he grew them. Same way with Peter and all the others when they were on their missionary journeys, when they would go into somewhere, they had to teach them and bring them along as far as they were themselves. And can I just say as a side note that each of us are in different places along this journey called Christianity, called life as a Christian. But each of us can bring somebody along with us up to the point to where we are at least that far. I mean, we are to be striving each and every day to continue to grow in our faith, to be strengthened in it and to walk in it and to see the power of God that he's talking about. And the power only comes through the Holy Spirit of God. We, he said in power and the Holy Spirit, great assurance. In other words, they were not just half-stepping about the gospel. They believed that the gospel was the power of God unto salvation. We'll see it in just a minute in Romans. But don't miss this. You and I have a responsibility to bring the gospel to others. But you and I also have the responsibility to help bring people along as we go. I, I mean, there should be some discipleship process going on to where you're bringing somebody to where you are and you're constantly moving forward. And if you get to the place to where you're all, both at the, on the same playing field, there are people even within the church that we have set up in leadership that are further along. You need to tag on to them, grab a hold of their coattails. Have you ever walked up to somebody and said, hey, would you mentor me? Have you ever done that? Can I give you a clue? Don't ask people to mentor you that do not follow Scripture. I, I don't care how smart they are. I don't care how much you think they know. I don't care how much they think they know. But please do not follow the instructions of people who are not filled with the Holy Spirit of God and are seeking God's will every single day of their lives to the best of their ability. I just talked to somebody just recently that was looking for spiritual advice and looking for it from somebody who don't even study the Bible themselves. And I'm like, how in the world do you think that you're going to get anywhere like that? The Apostle Paul, he goes into Thessalonica. He goes in there and he stays with them. As a matter of fact, Paul even encouraged the Ephesians. Paul encourages them to, it seems it even charges them in Ephesians 4, 20 and 24. But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him, have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning the former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the seedful lust. Then he says, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which is created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. And actually, if you look over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, you look over to verse 13, he even says, For this reason we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. He, he says, you received it from us and you took it as if it was the word of God. That, that, that uh, idea that the gospel is, is being coached by God, yes, through the scriptures, but through those who have previously been changed by it. That's why we send missionaries out into the field, not only to share the gospel, but then to, to lead people along in discipleship and get them rooted to a point to where they can walk on their own and then they start walking. 
And I don't know about you, but I realize that there are a lot of fledgling Christians in the church body. There are a lot of folks that they just, they're just barely keeping their nose out of the water, if you will, in the Christian life. They're not really growing. They're just kind of treading water. That's why we're pushing so hard for folks to get into some type of discipleship process. Because if you get in the Word of God, let the Word of God get into you, and you hang out with people of like-mindedness, you're going to grow. You're going to progressively move on so that you can take the baton and you can go pass the baton on to others while we run this race. The Apostle Paul, like I said a minute ago, he... Uh, he tells them to follow after me as I follow after Christ. 1 Corinthians 11, 1 and 2 says, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. Listen, listen to the words that Paul uses when he reflects on how important the believers are at Thessalonica where, uh, who were there with him. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 18 through 20. He says, therefore we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again, but Satan hindered. And, and that ought to be a lesson to us if we just pause there for one moment. Even the Apostle Paul, the one that made it to Rome through shipwreck and all kind of turmoil, God sent him and he made it there. But even in the life of somebody like Paul, Satan hindered him from getting to Thessalonica again so that he could see them. I just say that to say that if you're going to share the gospel, you're going to be in a battle. There's a fight. Even if you're going to live the gospel out in your own life. Even if you're going to try to live the gospel in your own house, it is going to be a fight. And we need to be prepared for spiritual warfare because we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rules of darkness in these heavenly places, in these spiritual places. And, and so there's this battle that ensues when we share the gospel. He says that he was battling, trying to get there. He says, verse uh, 19 says, for what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? For you are our glory and our joy. Can you hear the words of Paul? Can you hear his heart? He is rejoicing. He is excited about the fact that the gospel has gone out in there and he has helped them along, helped them get, be birthed into the kingdom, but also taken them through the nursery, through the preschool. He's taken them and got, he's gotten them to a point where they could walk on their own. He wanted to get back to them to encourage them some more and he couldn't get there, but he wanted them to know that they were his glory and joy. Now, I know that the Apostle Paul is not meaning that they're his glory as in God being his glory, ultimately his salvation. But when you think about what's going on here, he's basically saying that they are his honor and his happiness that's been bestowed upon the Apostle Paul by Jesus Christ. In other words, it was a great honor for the Apostle Paul to see what was going on happen and to be a part of it. And I, I just want to say this, it is an absolute joy for me as a child of God, beyond a, being a pastor, to be a part of people's lives being changed, to see homes changed, families restored, um, you know, deadbeat men become dads and become husbands. And, and to know, here's the thing, and I know what God did in my own life, and he'll, he'll do it in somebody else's life too. And maybe today your life is different because of the gospel. Uh, might I say this, if your life's not different, I don't know if the gospel's taking root in your life. But the Apostle Paul says, for those people who have been changed, who have been uh, converted, born again, it just brought great joy to him. Now, these people that have been changed, just as the Apostle Paul did, and I know it's kind of redundant, it's a little bit elementary to start with, but I think we need to get right down to the basics to where we can catch this thing. Do you know how the gospel actually gets out there? The gospel is carried by the very people it's changed. The gospel is carried out by the very people that it's changed. That's how Paul got to Thessalonica, but that's also how the Thessalonians spread the gospel from their place on out, and they did. And man, I'm telling you, to have it noted in the scriptures that you were so obedient to the gospel that Paul didn't even need to go out and spread the gospel because y'all, they had been shooting a wave of the gospel out so far, it was going beyond the apostle Paul. He was running into people going, man, God's doing something over there in Thessalonica. 
Uh, what, what kind of testimony? And we know that's what it ought to be, and we'll get to it a little more in a minute. But what kind of testimony would it be? Man, God's doing something in Kings Mountain, North Carolina. God's doing something in the heart and life of people at Chestnut Ridge, at First Baptist, at, at the Methodist Church, the Presbyterian Church, the, the Pentecostal Church. I don't care. If you, if you are a Christian and you preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, how wonderful would it be? Because you see, the Apostle Paul was not saying it was all about him. It was about Christ. And if you go through the words in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, you'll find Jesus Christ, our God and Father. You'll find those words over and over again. Why? Because it's not about just any church. It's about the gospel. It is about the spread of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And it gets out there with people that have been changed. You know, you know one thing they did not do at Thessalonica? They didn't say, you know what, Paul, I'll tell you what, we're going to hire you to be our preacher, and you can share the gospel. And then we, we, we'll just bring a bunch of people to church, and you can share the gospel with them. He didn't do, they didn't do that. They actually took it on themselves to share the gospel. Now, don't get me wrong. There is a place for everything. There's a place for the pastor. But you know that the place for the pastor in the Bible is actually so that he, they may equip the saints for the work of the ministry. In other words, just what I'm trying to do this morning, that is what I'm supposed to be doing. I am trying to equip you, give you the tools, encourage you with the tools, and we go out and we share the gospel. Now, I'm a part of it. I, I, and I, I believe that it's just as much my job to share the gospel as it is yours. Can I throw another kind of interesting fact on you? Do you know that nowhere in the Bible will you ever find a place where we're supposed to have revival services? Specifically have revival services. I, and I, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm not saying we're ungodly if we have revival services. But that's not God's ultimate plan to share the gospel. I think it's great to get a bunch of people together and to share the gospel. I think that's a great opportunity. Nothing wrong with that. But ultimately, it is a one-on-one -on -one responsibility of all of the saints of God to share it in the community with those people that we come in contact with, even to seek out people. I think you ought to put people in your sights. You ever done that before? It's like, wow, God, you brought this person into my neighborhood. They had no idea. Y'all all right? You brought this person into my neighborhood. God... You, you, you put a new waitress or a new waiter at the restaurant that I go to on a regular basis. <laughs> I'm going to start praying that you save them. I got some people I'm praying for right now. I hadn't approached them yet. They have no clue. But I, I, I'm telling you right now. Well, I have approached them a little bit. I've, I've, you know how the pixie dust goes out there and people do that? I go, hey, man. Uh, they, they'll be like, uh, thinking, I'll, I'll just go be nice to them. I, I need to hush because we're, we're on uh, camera, and if I open my mouth too much, they're going to figure out who I am. Um, but I'm like, go do something nice for them, love on them. Just go out of my way to be there in their life to earn an opportunity to share the gospel of Christ with them. Got them in the sights. Got them, you know, this is public enemy number one right here. You know, we're going to take them out for the glory of God. You ever have anybody like that that you just put in your sights and you just go after them like no tomorrow? I mean, like every moment you're just like, wow, pray for them. God, would you just ignite the gospel in their heart? Would you save them, God? You know, it'd be so awesome, God, if you would just do something radical in their lives. It would encourage me, God, just like it encouraged Paul in Thessalonica. And, and i just be honest with you in my heart, and i just share this because i got so much in my heart I want to share today. i got to stay on track. But I'm just going to tell you, I've been praying that God would reignite something in me because I don't know that I'm as passionate about the gospel now as I used to be. And I don't know that the gospel is working in my life like it used to, but I know this. It never was my gospel to begin with. It wasn't my fire to begin with. So the same God that ignited it in me before, he's the same God that can reignite it in me today. And he can do the same things even greater than he did before in my life and in yours too. He can do it. All he needs is a willing vessel. All he needs is a, a, a vessel in which he might pour. And do you realize it don't matter what the vessel looks like? No. He, he takes joy, he says, in putting his precious, 
possession in this broken vessel. And so, so often we try to make the vessel look good when all in all we are to be just who God has made us to be and let the glory of the chosen possession that we have be seen to be him and not the vessel. Oh, gosh, I'm telling you. Anyhow, I'm sorry. The gospel is carried by the very people it changed. Listen, listen in our text. Verse 5, starting there. He says, For our gospel is not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake, and you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit. Then listen. And so that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe, for from you the word of the Lord has, what, sounded forth. It's almost as if the trumpet blast has gone out about the gospel. He says, from you the word of God has sounded forth from those people throughout all of Macedonia and Achaia, from Thessalonica, those, those believers there, it sounded forth. And then listen, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith toward God has gone out so that we don't need to say anything. He, he says, the, and, and, and for the Apostle Paul to say this, that's pretty, pretty big. I mean, that's a huge statement that the Apostle Paul says, y'all are sounding forth the gospel so much that everywhere I go, I'm running into the testimony of y'all's sharing the gospel. I think that's huge. Uh, let me throw a few thoughts on you. Do you know that changed people are commissioned people? Matthew 28, 19, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Changed people are faithful people. Matthew 24, 14, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Now I want you to think about something. I've said this about certain things that if God, gosh, I hope y'all can track this if you can, good. If God would not have put certain passions within men, we might not have children. Because if not, we would be fishing and hunting and riding motorcycles and falling out of trees and all kind of stuff. Y'all with me? God did that. You, you can say what you want to. I can promise you right now. God did that. Now, the same God that did that, he does something in a believer's life. I believe that when God saves somebody, that the commission of the gospel is implanted into the very heart and soul of a human being. I believe that we become faithful, not because we want to be faithful, to the gospel because we weren't faithful to the gospel before he changed us. But the reason that we're faithful, the reason that we assemble together, the reason that we read our Bibles, the reason that we pray, the reason that we love people that we wouldn't normally love, why? It's because of 2 Corinthians 5, 17. The old has passed away, the new has come, he's changed us, we're living in this new, new uh, idea of, uh, well, I've said it so many times, Christians are only bipolar people that I know for sure are bipolar. The, what I will to do, I don't do. And what I don't want to do, I do. And the flesh, I, I know that there is a law of the flesh because it wars against the law of the Spirit. And, and, and this battle's going on. But that battle is because God has changed us. We don't just go share the gospel because we won't wake up one day and go, you know what, I'm going to go spread the good news of Jesus Christ to everybody. No, God does that. You know that changed people are unashamed people? Romans 1 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God and salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. And if I can put this plug in there, especially since we're online, I want y'all to hear this. Do you know one of the greatest battles that Paul was having? Is that some of the, the especially the Jews that he had been dealing with before he got to Thessalonica, they didn't want him to share the gospel with the Gentiles. You know why they didn't want him to share the gospel with the Gentiles? Because they didn't want Gentiles coming to church with them. Well, then, I'm, I'm, come on, y'all got to at least follow me a little bit on this one. 
He didn't want them to share the gospel with the Gentiles. And he even says, if you read on in our text, he says, y'all bear the same burden from your own people that I bore back there with my people. In other words, they were starting to go, you can go out here and share this gospel, but don't share it with everybody. I've had one standing line. Everybody's got to put lines in the sand. I've got one standing line in, for me as a pastor. The day that I'm not, the day that everyone's not welcome to hear the gospel, I'm checking out. I'll bust my feet off and I'll move on to other ground, just like Paul did. Why? Because who am I to think that I have, because of the color of my skin, the place that I was raised, and the place that I was born, think that I have some monopoly on the gospel of Jesus Christ when the gospel actually came to me from another land? And one of the greatest detriments to the kingdom of God that we've ever had is the word race. Did you know that there is no such thing as races? There is the human race. That is a man-made thing, the word called race. Just because somebody's got more melatonin, uh, no, melanin, and mel melatonin. I wish I had some melatonin. <laughs> um, more melanin in their skin than other people do. As a matter of fact, I heard Vody Balkum say one time to a group of folks that were primarily Caucasian at a church, he said, he said I promise you, Vody Balkum is a black man, he said, I promise you, God does not love you any less just because he didn't give you much melanin as he gave me. <laughs> My point is that one of the things, I just want to throw this in there because one of the things that we got to get right off the bat, and it's not always the color of skin, sometimes it's socioeconomical stuff. You know, well, we, well, preacher, you know, they just don't have morals like we do. Don't none of us have no morals till Jesus gives them to us. We at least don't have anybody governing the morals with, that we've been taught. Anyhow, the first service didn't get that, but that's all right. <clears throat> Let me tell you a little story real quick as we um, kind of bring things around. Statement says you, 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 can't, you can count the apples on a tree, but you can't count the apples in a seed. So it is with the influence of a single person. Take Edward Kimball, for example. Never heard of him? <clears throat> Rest assured, most people haven't heard of him. Kimball was a Sunday school teacher who not only prayed for the hyper boys in his class, but also sought to win each one of them to the Lord personally. He decided he would be intentional with every single last one of them. Surely he thought about throwing them, throwing in the towel. If you have ever taught the Bible to young boys, you know that the experience can be often like herding cats. One young man in particular didn't seem to understand what the gospel was about. <clears throat> so Kimball went to the shoe store where he was stocking shelves and confronted him in the stock room with the importance of the personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That young man was Dwight L. Moody. In the stock room on that Saturday, he believed the gospel and received Jesus Christ as his Savior. In his lifetime, Moody touched two continents for God with thousands professing Christ through his ministry. But the story doesn't end there. It actually just starts there. Under Moody, another man's heart was touched by God, Wilbur Chapman. Chapman became the evangelist who preached to thousands. One day, a professional ball player had a day off and attended one of Chapman's meetings, and thus Billy Sunday was converted. Sunday quit baseball, became part of Chaplin's team. Then Chapman uh, uh, accepted the pastorate at a large church, and Billy Sunday began his own evangelistic crusades. Another young man was converted whose name was Mordecai Ham. He was a scholarly, dignified gentleman who wasn't above renting a hearse and parading it through the streets advertising his meetings. When Ham came to Charlotte, North Carolina, a sandy-haired, lanky young man in high school vowed that he wouldn't go to hear him preach, but Billy Frank, as he was called by his family, didn't, did eventually go. Ham announced that he knew for a fact that a house of ill repute was located across the street from the local high school and that male students were skipping lunch to visit the house across the street. I told y'all God put something in me. Anyhow, when students decided to go to interrupt the meetings of Mordecai Ham, Billy Frank decided to go see what would happen. 
That night, Billy Frank went and was intrigued by what he heard. Returning another night, he responded to the invitation and was converted. Billy Frank eventually became known as Billy Graham, the evangelist who preached to more people than any other person that's ever lived, including the Apostle Paul. You could continue following his trail and see where Graham and all of us started with the ministry of Jesus. Think about how far-reaching Christ's message has gone. Did you know that the gospel is cast out further than your physical presence? The gospel is cast out further than your physical presence. Listen to it once again. Verse 8, For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith toward God has gone out so that we do not need to say anything. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you, and how you turned to God from idols, serving the living and true God. This is the testimony about the Thessalonians. And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivered us from the wrath to come. The gospel that was given to the people in Thessalonica... It was cast out. Their testimony went further out than their physical presence. And can I just say this? The same thing can be true in your life if you're used by the gospel. If you are used by God, the same thing that your testimony, you say, oh, no, not mine. Once again, don't you dare underestimate your influence. Let me share with you two quick stories to close. I was pastoring the Montford Cove Baptist Church on the Rutherford and McDowell County line. And let me just say this. I'm talking in the middle of the sticks. I'm talking over in drive 35 minutes to get to a grocery store in the middle of the sticks. Plan your trip. Take a sandwich with you because you just might not get out or back in because a tree might fall off a bank at any time and you keep a chainsaw in the back of your car. Can I get a witness? Amen. I see somebody that knows what I'm talking about. But somehow, some way, we, we went from about 60 in Sunday school in 21 months to 120. Baptized nearly 40 people in 21 months back there in the middle of the sticks. Even got one, and I don't know why I'm telling this part, but I just, I'll get there. One man's house, never been in an experience like this, but he had, he had pneumonia and he thought he was going to die. I went into his house. I was privileged because everybody didn't get, go back to his house. His brother walked me in, and if his brother hadn't walked me in, I might not have made it back out to this little cabin. You couldn't drive up to it. You had to walk into it. Walked up in there. No electricity, none of that, none of the conveniences. And there's a wood log sitting up there by a wood stove in the middle of the room. And he's sitting on it wrapped up in a blanket, freezing to death. And I got to go back there and pray with him and share the gospel with him. He would drive by the house, the parsonage beforehand, never would look my way. After that, he'd honk the horn and wave at me. I'm just telling you the gospel's real. Amen. So I went with a group of guys, about five or six guys. We went down in 2007, Hurricane Katrina relief with North Carolina Baptist men. We went down to Gulfport, Mississippi. We're down there working. And I tell you, I, um, I went down there and I was praying, man. I was over in the corner. Lord, please don't let me work on sheetrock. Please, God, don't let me work on sheetrock. I'm telling, I want you to hear two things. I don't know how to do sheetrock work. Everybody got that? You keep that in your pocket and pull it back out after I get through telling this story. I do know how to do sheetrock a little bit. And me and a couple of the guys in there with me knew how to do sheetrock. And finally, when we got down to the idea, we realized it's like, okay, we know how to do sheetrock. So every house down there from about four foot down because of flooding, they had cut the sheetrock all the way and gutted it out. And so we did sheetrock on our knees. And I, there's two places I don't want to do sheetrock, on my knees and up over my head. But for the glory of God, we planned our week. We planned our week. We, we wanted to go to New Orleans. Some of us had never been to New Orleans. I think there's only one guy in the crew that had been to New Orleans. Never been to New Orleans. So here we go. We, we worked hard, and on Friday we took off for New Orleans. Got up early that morning. Anybody ever been to New Orleans in here? Got a few? 
Lake Pontchartrain. Glory to God. That's a long ride across the bridge. Especially when it's foggy and Hurricane Katrina has knocked some of the barriers down on the side of the, the, the bridge and it's fog, you can't see nothing. You're about halfway out across Lake Pontchartrain and the, and, and the fog opens and they've got caution tape from one barrier to the next on the open side of the bridge and there's Lake Pontchartrain. I'm like, good grief, how do they get away with this? We go in, we go down to the French Quarter. We're walking around and New Orleans starts coming to life. By that afternoon, there's street performers out there. And, and I'm just in awe of the, the fact that I'm underwater because of the levees. I'm like looking over at the pumps. I'm a mechanical guy. I'm going, keep pumping, keep pumping, keep pumping. And, you know, and here we are. And there, um, these street performers come out. So we're, we're walking around, and I'm like, and I told you before, I believe there was a time in my life when the gospel was just so much, I don't know, moving. And I'm praying for that again. There was a street performer there. We're standing there watching him. His game is, hey, give me $20. I'll answer any question you can ask me. So I'm standing there, and as God is my witness, the Spirit of God spoke to my heart, and I hear out of my mouth it come. I said, hey, dude, I got one for you. I said, I'll give you the $20, but I'll answer any question you ask me. There's about 150, 200 people gathered around this dude. He says, who are you? I told him my name. He said, what do you do? I said, I'm a pastor of a church. Then he started calling me preach from that point forward, preach. He's a black dude named Kenny. Never forget, I got a picture of him, me and him together with them people. So we talked a little bit. He said, all right, I got my question, preach. I said, go for it. He said, I had a 16-year-old daughter. A couple months ago, she committed suicide. He said, where is she? I said, well, you get to ask some questions, so let me ask you a couple questions. Talked to him a little bit about his, asked him some questions about his daughter. And I said, Kenny, y'all ever have any connection with church or anything? And he said, well, he said, it's kind of interesting you ask that. He said, about six months before she died, a little Baptist church started coming and picking her up on a Wednesday night, taking her to youth group. I said, okay. I said, well, Kenny, here's the deal. I'm not God. I don't know. I said, but here's the thing I do know. I said, I know without a doubt that if she heard the gospel and responded to it, there's not a sin on this earth that the gospel won't cover. Now, I know there's some people who want to discuss that. I'll gladly discuss that with you. Outside of rejection of the Holy Spirit, there's not a thing in this world that the gospel won't cover. And if you don't know nothing about anxieties and depression and all these things, I'd love to sit down and talk with you about these. So my door's always open. So anyhow, I said, Kenny, I said, if she happened to hear the gospel and she responded to it, and I said, and if they're worth their salt, she heard the gospel in six months. I sure hope she did. And she responded to it, then I can tell you, I believe she's home with Jesus. I said, but again, I don't know. I'm not God. I said, but here's the bigger question, Kenny. I said, what if she did make it? What about you? What you going to do? Where are you at with this thing? And as, again, as God is my witness, that man got down on his knees in front of over 150 people and gave his life to Jesus Christ. And I got to pray with him. I'm telling you, Ray Elder was his name. That's the guy that led me to faith in Jesus Christ. August 1999, he come into single-wide mobile home in Winsboro, South Carolina. Most of the folks that's been here for any years, they can tell you what color the carpet was. Powder blue. Or shag blue carpet, I'm sorry, with a powder blue Queen Anne chair. And again, I ain't telling the story of why, but why a Queen Anne chair is in a single-wide mobile home, it's a long story, but we, I can tell you that sometime. Ray never had a success, what we would call a successful pastorate. Never did. But then again, Adrian Rogers, I heard it quoted this week. Adrian Rogers said that 
it'll take another world to find out who the greatest preachers actually were. Ray was working at a uh, at the record in the records room at Fairfield Memorial Hospital in 2003, and uh, I was getting ready to leave to come to Hendersonville to go to Bible College. Christy had already moved up with the girls to get them settled in school, and I had some things to finish up with Michelin before I could leave them. So I left on a Friday at Michelin, started school on Tuesday at Fruitland. But that week, my last week, I went over to the records room at Fairfield Memorial Hospital, and I sat down with Ray, and I said, Ray, I said, I'm fixing to leave out, bud. I said, I want to come by here and thank you for sharing the gospel with me. I said, my wife has a new husband, kids have a new dad, and God has a soldier. I said, Ray, I, want you, I know you're kind of discouraged about some things right now because the church you're serving at, it disbanded and you, you're trying to find out where God wants you to be. I said, but let me tell you something, dude. I said, I, and since 19, August 99 to September 2003, I said, I've looked in the eyes of nearly 100 people and, and I prayed for them to receive Jesus Christ. They prayed to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And uh, I said, I ain't done yet, man. I'm not done. I said, matter of fact, just might be getting started. I said, so Ray, your investment into the kingdom is multiplying times over. And I said, I just want to thank you. And I said, one day, you and I will sit down together and we'll count them all up. That's why Paul said, he said, y'all are our joy. He's already there. Went to his funeral not too long ago. He's already there. Maybe he's met some of them. But one day, I'll get to be there with him. And Kenny from New Orleans, he'll be there. And he don't look like me. He didn't grow up like me, but he'll be there. All because of the gospel. Here's my question to you. If you could just think of one person, one person that you could put in your bullseye, who would it be? I mean, you got to start somewhere. Is it a family member? Is it a friend? Is it a neighbor? Is it somebody who you hate at the grocery store that you, you just want to see their life changed for the glory of God because you know they're lost? Who is it? Who's the one that you would put in your sights? Who is it? And I want you to start praying for them. And I want you to be praying about who it is and then start praying for them. And let's lock in. And set our sights on that person. Because if everybody in this room would just go to one person with the gospel and God change them, look what would happen in the kingdom. And who knows what that person may do? Who, who knows? They may be the next evangelist or the next whatever that leads countless millions. It's said that Billy Graham shared the gospel with over 2.2 billion people in his lifetime. Now, all of them didn't come to faith in Christ, but many of them did. So I'm going to ask you to stand with me for just a moment. If you just, for a minute, if you just bow your heads for just a minute and just have your, your moment right there. I wonder if there's anybody in this room that you know without a shadow of a doubt that you're lost. If you were to die today, standing before God... And you have no clue as to why he would let you into heaven or even if he would let you into heaven to be with him. If that's you and you, you want to today, you want to get that nailed down. You want to today, you, you've heard that Jesus died on the cross for you. He was buried in a tomb and on the third day, just as the Bible said, he rose from the dead. He's seated at the right hand of the throne of God even right now interceding on our behalf. If that's you, and you don't know Christ, and you, but you would like to have a relationship with Jesus Christ today, be saved. Would you just slide your hand up? Even in a crowd like this, I never know. Is there anybody here that would just say, I'm lost, preacher, and I need to be saved? All right. For everybody that is a child of God today, 
I want to just encourage you. I want, I'm going to pray over you in a moment. We're going to sing, and I'm going, I'm going to, when we leave out of here, I'm going to pray over you. But I, I just want to encourage you. You have the same spirit, the same power residing in you that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Same spirit as the Apostle Paul and the same gospel. You're, you're not defeated. You are victorious if you're in Jesus Christ. And I want you to hear that. You are victorious. Death has no hold on you. The grave has no victory over you. The sting is gone. And you and I are bold, the boldest soldiers on the face of the planet. Why? Because we don't fear death because death can't conquer us. Father, as we sing this song, God, would you do your work? This altar always being open. God, anybody that needs to just needs somebody to pray with them. God, would you just do your work your way for Christ's sake. Amen. I